The Kingdom of Sarawak, also known as the State of Sarawak, was a British protectorate located in the northwestern part of the island of Borneo. It was established as an independent kingdom from a series of land concessions acquired by an Englishman, James Brooke, from the Sultanate of Brunei. The kingdom received recognition as an independent state from the United States in 1850 and from the United Kingdom in 1864. Following recognition, Brooke expanded the kingdom territory at the expense of Brunei. Several major rebellions occurred against his rule, causing him to be plagued by debt incurred in countering the rebellions, and the sluggish economic situation at the time. His nephew, Charles Brooke, succeeded James and normalized the situation by improving the economy, reducing government debts and establishing public infrastructure. The kingdom was made a British protectorate in 1888. To gear up economic growth, the Second Rajah encouraged the migration of Chinese workers from China and Singapore to work in the agricultural fields. With proper economic planning and stability, Sarawak prospered and emerged as one of the world's major producers of black pepper, in addition to oil and the introduction of rubber plantations. He was succeeded by his son Charles Viner Brooke but World War II and the arrival of Japanese forces ultimately brought an end to the Raj and the Protectorate administration, with the territory placed under a military administration on the Japanese capitulation in 1945, and ceded to Britain as a crown colony in 1946. The area now forms the Malaysian state of Sarawak. History Topic. Foundation and early years The kingdom was founded by James Brooke, an English adventurer who arrived to the banks of Sarawak River and decided to berth his schooner there in 1839. After serving in the First Anglo-Burmese War where he was severely wounded in battle, Brooke returned to England in 1825 to recover from his injury. Despite his attempts to return into service, he was unable to return to his station in India before his temporary leave from the service expired. Overstaying his furlough resulting in his position in the military being forfeited, but he was awarded a pension by the government for his service. He continued on from India and went to China to improve his health. On his way to China in 1830, he saw the islands of the Asiatic archipelago, still generally unknown to Europeans. He returned to England and made an abortive trading journey to China in the Findlay before his father died in 1835. Inspired by the adventure stories regarding the success of the East India Company EIC, where his father had been serving especially from the efforts of Stamford Raffles to expanding the company influence in the Asiatic archipelago, he purchased a schooner named Royalist using the £30,000 left to him by his father. He recruited a crew for the schooner, training in the Mediterranean Sea in late 1836, before beginning their sail to the Far East on 27 October 1838. By July 1839, he reached Singapore and came across some British sailors who had been shipwrecked and helped by Penjiran Raja Muda Hashim, the uncle of Sultan Omar Ali Saifuddin II of Brunei. Brooke originally planned to sail to Marudu Bay in northwestern Borneo, but the British Governor General in Singapore asked him to thank Raja Muda Hashim in southwestern Borneo. The following month he sailed to the western coast of the island and on 14 August 1839, berthed his schooner on the banks of the Sarawak River and met Hashim to deliver the message. The Raja told Brooke that his presence in the area was to control a rebellion against the Sultanate of Brunei caused by the oppressive policies of Penjiran Indera Makota, a kinsman of the Sultan. Makota had earlier been dispatched by the Sultan to monopolize the antimony in the area, which as a result directly affecting the incomes of the local Malays there and growing frustration from the indigenous land Dayak who had been forced to work in the mines for about ten years. It has also been alleged that the rebellion against Brunei was aided by the neighboring Sultanate of Sambas and the government of the Dutch East Indies, who wanted to establish economic rights over the antimony. Despite Hashim's efforts to stop the rebellion, it came to no avail thus leading him to seek direct help from Brooke. Responding to the request, a force of local natives that was raised and led by Brooke managed to temporarily stop the rebellion. Brooke was granted a large quantity of antimony from the local mines and authority in the Sarawak River area as a reward. After that, Brooke became embroiled in Hashim's campaign to restore order in the area. Brooke returned to Singapore and spent another six months cruising along the coasts of the Celebes Islands before returning to Sarawak on 29 August 1840. <inaudible> <inaudible> establishment 
Upon his returning to Sarawak, the rebellion against Brunei's rule was still in progress. He managed to completely suppress the rebellion and pardoned the rebels for joining his side, providing positions in some administrative authority while limiting their power. Despite the initial refusal of Hashim to pardon them and wanting to execute all the rebels, Hashim was convinced by Brooke to forgive them as he had taken the major part in their suppression. In exchange for Brooke's continuous support towards the Sultanate and rental payment of £500, he was awarded the Kuching area from the Sultanate of Brunei, which later became Sarawak 1st Division. Hashim, however, began to think twice about giving the territory to Brooke, a doubt fanned by Makota who had been deprived of his power in the area in favour of Brooke. This led Hashim to constantly delay the recognition of concession and angered Brooke. Brooke, with Royalist fully armed, went ashore to Hashim's audience chamber and called on him to negotiate. With little choice, and putting the blame mainly on Makota, Hashim granted Sarawak to Brooke on 24 September 1841. Brooke issued new laws for the territory banning slavery, headhunting and piracy, and by July 1842, his appointment was confirmed by Sultan Omar Ali Saifuddin II. To prevent any further dispute with Brunei, Brooke hoped to reform the administration of the Sultanate and establish a pro-British government through Hashim and his brother Penjiran Badruddin. By October 1843, Brooke returned the two brothers to Brunei, bringing along Admiral Edward Belcher of the Royal Navy in HMS Samarang and the EIC Phlegathin. The vessels anchored at the Sultan's audience chamber, requesting Penjiran Yusuf's position as Bendahara to be replaced by Hashim and asking the Sultan to pledge to suppress piracy in his dominions, as well ceding the island of Labuan to the British although the British government had not asked for this. The status of Brooke as a Raja and consul for the British at the time also remained controversial in the United Kingdom as he was not recognised by the British government to represent the British subjects. Indirectly, Brooke had become involved in an internal dynastic dispute of Brunei. From 1844, Brooke actively assisted the suppression of piracy on the coasts of western and northern Borneo together with Admiral Henry Keppel in HMS Dido along with Phlegathin, where during the course of piracy suppression they encountered Makota, the former administrator of Kuching area who had formed an alliance with an Sea Dayak pirate chief on the Skrang River in Sarawak and captured him in the same year. In August 1845, Admiral Thomas Cochrane arrived at Brunei with a squadron of from six to eight ships to release two Lasker seamen who were believed to be hidden there. Badruddin accused Yusuf of being involved in the slave trade due to his close relations with a notable pirate leader Sharif Usman in Marudu Bay and the Sultanate of Sulu. Denying the allegation, Yusuf refused to attend a meeting with Cochrane, and escaped after being threatened with force by Cochrane before regaining his own force in the Brunei capital. Cochrane then sailed away to Marudu Bay in pursuit of Usman, while Yusuf was defeated by Badruddin. Hashim managed to establish a rightful position in Brunei town to become the next sultan after successfully defeating the piratical forces led by Yusuf who fled to Kamanis in northern Borneo where he was executed. Yusuf was the favorite noble to the sultan and with Hashim's victory, this upset the chances of the son of Sultan Omar Ali Saifuddin II to become the next leader. Makota, who had returned to Brunei in 1845 after his capture in Sarawak in 1844 became the Sultan's advisor in the absence of Yusuf who had been executed. He prevailed on the Sultan to order the execution of Hashim, whose presence had become unwelcome to the royal family, especially due to his close ties with Brooke that were favourable to English policy. Beside that, an adventurer named Haji Saman, who was connected to the late Yusuf, played upon the Sultan's fear of Hashim taking over his throne. By the order of the Sultan, Hashim and his brother Badruddin together with their family were assassinated in 1846. One of Badruddin's slaves, Japar, survived the attack and intercepted HMS Hazard, which brought him to Sarawak to inform Brooke. Enraged by the news, Brooke organized an expedition to avenge Hashim's death with the aid of Cochrane from the Royal Navy with Phlegathin. On 6 July 1846, Sultan Omar Ali Saifuddin II complained through a letter about the discourtesy of HMS Hazard and invited Cochrane to ascend the capital with two boats. Phlegathin and other vessels then moved up to the river on 8 July where they were fired on from every position with slight damage. Makota and the Sultan retreated upriver while most of the population fled upon their arrival at Brunei's capital, leaving the brother of the Sultan's son, Penjiran Muhammad, who was badly wounded and Penjiran Mumin, an opponent of the Sultan's son who despised the decision of his royal family to be involved in conflict with the British. 
The British destroyed the town forts and invited the population to return with no harm to be done to them while the Sultan remained hiding in the jungle. Another expedition was sent to the interior but also failed to find the Sultan. Brooke remained in Brunei with Admiral Rodney Mundy and HMS Iris along with Phlegathin and HMS Hazard while the main expedition continued their mission to suppress piracy in northern Borneo. Upon finding that Haji Saman was living in Kamanis and that he was involved in the plotting that caused Hashim's death, Brooke departed there and destroyed his house although Saman still managed to escape. Brooke returned again to Brunei and finally managed to induce the Sultan to return to the capital where the Sultan finally regretted the killings of Hashim, his brother and their family members by writing a letter of apology to Queen Victoria. Through his confession, the Sultan recognized Brooke's authority over Sarawak and mining rights throughout the territory without requiring him to pay any tribute as well granting the island of Labuan to the British. Brooke departed Brunei and left Mumin in charge together with Mundi to keep the Sultan in line until the British government made a final decision to acquire the island. Following the ratification agreement of the transfer of Labuan to the British, the Sultan also finally agreed to allow British forces to suppress all piracy along the coast of Borneo. <laughs> Later years The following year, 1847, Brooke asked the Sultan of Brunei to sign another treaty to prevent the Sultanate from engaging in any concession treaty with other foreign powers especially after the visit of USS Constitution in 1845. American policy at the time however made no intention to establish any solid presence in Asia and the Pacific. By 1850, the United States recognized the status of Brooke's kingdom as an independent state. Sultan Omar Ali Saifuddin II died in 1852 and he was succeeded by Mumin, which already proved a success in Brooks' efforts to establish a pro-British government in Brunei. The new Sultan then ceded Saribas and Skrang districts, which later became the Second Division, to Brook in 1853 due to conflict with pirates. Three major rebellions led by Rentap 1853, Lushan Bang 1857, and Sairif Masahor 1860 shook the Raja's administration which, together with the stagnant economic conditions at the time, caused Brook to be plagued by debt. He was driven into planning to cede his kingdom to the British to settle his debt, while the idea was supported by some of Britain's members of Parliament MPs and businessmen, it was rejected by Prime Minister Lord Derby who feared that the introduction of a British taxation system would shock the population more than exercising their own system under the Rajas. There were also concerns about its financial viability and probable drain on the exchequer. Brooke then thought to sell his kingdom to Belgium, France, Russia or to Brunei again or also to other European powers rather than to the neighbouring Dutch who were ready to retake his kingdom. Brooke's intention had already been decried by neighbouring British governors such as Labuan Governor Hennessy who, while respecting the Raja, considered the kingdom a mere vassal state of Brunei. Prior to the ongoing piracy suppression, a major battle with the Ilanuns of Moro pirates from the southern Philippines occurred in mid-November 1862. In 1864, the United Kingdom appointed a consul to Sarawak and recognized the kingdom, while the Netherlands refused recognition. Brooke then expanded his kingdom into territory of Brunei. In 1861, he acquired the vast Rajang River Basin, which subsequently became the Third Division. The expansion continued after his death in 1868, when he was succeeded by his nephew, Charles Brooke. Under Charles's administration, the kingdom's economy grew rapidly, especially later on with the discovery of oil, introduction of rubber, and the construction of public infrastructure as his main priorities to stabilize the economic situation and reduce government debts. He encouraged the migration of Chinese to boost the economy, especially in agricultural sectors, where most of them settled around Kuching mainly Hokkien and Teochew, Cebu mainly Fuzhou, and Sri Amman mainly Teochew. Charles was trusted and respected for his fairness and strict order, although he was not so popular among the local Malays as his uncle, while being a close friend to the Dayaks. Sarawak prospered under his rule and the kingdom did not seek protection from any European powers although requests for protection from the British in 1869 and 1879 were rejected. Charles continued to seek protection from the British, securing protectorate status from them on 14 June 1888. He ruled Sarawak until his death in 1917 and was succeeded by his son, Charles Viner Brooke. World War II and decline 
Following World War I, the Empire of Japan began to expand their range in Asia and the Pacific. Viner became aware of the growing threats and began to institute reforms. Under the Protectorate Treaty, Britain was responsible for Sarawak's defence but it could do little, most of its forces having been deployed to the war in Europe against Nazi Germany and the Kingdom of Italy. The defence of the kingdom depended on a single Indian infantry regiment, the 215th Punjab Regiment, together with the local forces of Sarawak and Brunei. As Sarawak had a significant number of oil refineries in Miri and Lutong, the British feared that these supplies would fall to the Japanese and thus instructed the infantry to carry out a scorched earth policy. On 16 December 1941, a Japanese Navy detachment on Japanese destroyer Sagiri arrived at Miri from Kam Ran Bay of French Indochina. The Japanese then launched an air attack on Kuching on 19 December, bombing parts of the town airfield while machine gunning people in the town streets. The attack created panic and drove residents to the rural areas. The Dutch submarine HNLMSK-16 managed to bring down the Japanese from Miri but, with the arrival of the Japanese destroyer Shirakumo together with other ships, the Japanese secured the town on 24 December. From 7 January 1942, Japanese troops in Sarawak crossed the border of Dutch Borneo and proceeded to neighbouring North Borneo. The 215th Punjab Regiment were forced to withdraw to Dutch Borneo and later surrendered on 9 March after most of the Allies had surrendered in Java. A steamship of the kingdom, the SS Viner Brook, was sunk while evacuating nurses and wounded servicemen in the aftermath of the fall of Singapore. Most of its surviving crew were massacred on Bangka Island. Lacking air protection, the kingdom, together with rest of the island, fell to the Japanese and Viner took sanctuary in Australia. Many of the British and Australian soldiers captured after the fall of Malaya and Singapore were brought to Borneo and held as prisoners of war in Batu Lintang camp in Sarawak and Sandakan camp in neighbouring North Borneo. The Japanese military authorities placed the southern part of Borneo under the navy, while its army were responsible for management of the north. As part of the Allied campaign to retake their possessions in the east, Allied forces were then sent to Borneo in the Borneo campaign and liberated the island. The Australian Imperial Force AIF played a significant role in the mission. The Allies' Z Special Unit provided intelligence gathering which facilitated the AIF landings. Most of the major towns of Sarawak were bombed during this period. The war ended on 15 August 1945 following the Japanese surrender and the administration of Sarawak was undertaken by the British Military Administration BMA from September. Viner returned to administer his kingdom but decided to cede it to the British government as a crown colony on 1 July 1946 due to lack of resources to finance reconstruction. <laughs> government Prior to the establishment of the Sarawak Administrative Service under the Second Rajah, there had been no formal civil administration. The civil service recruited Europeans, mainly British officers, to run district out stations where the residents became exposed to and trained in many British and European methods and culture, while retaining the customs of the indigenous people. After the acquisition of more territory, the kingdom was divided into five divisions, each headed by a resident. The Rajas also encouraged the establishment of schools, healthcare services, and transport. The government worked to restore peace where piracy and tribal feuds had grown rampant, and its success depended ultimately on the cooperation of the native village headmen, while the native officers acted as a bridge. The Sarawak Rangers was established in 1862 as a paramilitary force of the kingdom. It was superseded by the Sarawak Constabulary in 1932 as a police force, with 900 members mainly comprising Dayaks and Malays. As a British protectorate, all powers of governance were conducted under the purview of the British government although constitutionally remaining an independent state ruled by the Rajas. According to an agreement signed on 14 June 1888, it was stipulated, I, the state of Sarawak shall continue to be governed and administered by the said Raja and his successors as an independent state under the protection of Great Britain, but such protection shall confer no right on Her Majesty's government to interfere with the internal administration of the state further than is herein provided, too. In case any question should hereafter arise respecting the rights of succession to the present or any future ruler of Sarawak, such question shall be referred to Her Majesty's government for decision. 3. 
The relations between the state of Sarawak and all foreign states, including the states of Brunei and North Borneo, shall be conducted by Her Majesty's government, or in accordance with its directions, and if any difference should arise between the government of Sarawak and that of any other state, the government of Sarawak agrees to abide by the decision of Her Majesty's government, and to take all steps necessary to give effect thereto, i.v. Her Majesty's Government shall have the right to establish British consular officers in any part of the state of Sarawak, who shall receive exequators in the name of the Government of Sarawak. They shall enjoy whatever privileges are usually granted to the consular officers, and shall be entitled to hoist the British flag over their residences and public offices, v. British subjects, commerce, and shipping shall enjoy the same right, privileges, and advantages as the subjects, commerce, and shipping of the most favoured nation, as well as any other rights, privileges, and advantages which may be enjoyed by the subjects, commerce and shipping of the state of Sarawak, v. No cession or other alienation of any part of the territory of the state of Sarawak shall be made by the Raja or his successors to any foreign state, or the subjects or the citizens thereof, without the consent of Her Majesty's government, but this restriction shall not apply to ordinary grants or leases of lands or houses to private individuals for purposes of residence, agriculture, commerce, or other business. Economy. Upon acquisition of his first territories in the First Division, Brooke came into possession of a large quantity of antimony from mines around the area. At the time of his arrival, a land tenure system known as the Native Customary Rights had been practiced by the indigenous communities. Brooke's first priority was to abolish headhunting among the indigenous communities of the interior. The kingdom's authorities conducted repeated raids on Si Dayak villages and, facing a major rebellion, ultimately forced them to practice horticulture and abandon headhunting. Land Dayaks had also been involved in headhunting but more readily abandoned the practice and became loyal followers of Brook. Most Malay coastal villages were also raided as part of the kingdom's policy to combat piracy and slavery. Despite success in these endeavors, stagnant economic conditions persisted and the kingdom amassed huge debts. Brooke promoted Chinese immigration, convinced that they would inject vigor into the economy and prove an encouragement to indigenous communities to participate. Initially, most of the immigrants were miners originating from Sambas in neighboring Dutch Borneo. These later formed a Kongzi system in Bao. The second Raja continued this policy, particularly targeting the agricultural sector. Conflicts ensued between the government and the Chinese in 1857, believed to have arisen, inter alia, in relation to the Second Opium War. Borneo Company Limited was formed in 1856. It was involved in a wide range of businesses in Sarawak, including trade, banking, agriculture, mineral exploration, and development. The Second Raja worked to stabilize the economy and reduce government debt. The economy grew significantly under his reign, with total exports reaching $386,439 and imports $414,756 in 1863. In 1869, by which time total trade had reached $3,262,500, the second Rajah invited Chinese black pepper and gambier growers from Singapore to cultivate their crops in Sarawak. As a result, by the early 20th century, Sarawak became one of the world's major producers of pepper. The kingdom was a relative latecomer to the natural rubber boom due to the reluctance of the second Raja to give over indigenous farmland to European companies. Only five large rubber estates were established during his reign. Oil reserves were discovered in his final years. From the 1930s, through the work of the Chinese businesses in the kingdom, it became a significant raw material supplier, with Singapore a major trading partner. Currency A Sarawak dollar was first issued in 1858 and remained at par with the Straits dollar. Different notes were issued by the Sarawak government treasury, the earliest notes using English, Jawi and Chinese characters. From 1880s, the note's background featured the Raja's portrait and coat of arms. Society Demography In 1841, Sarawak had an indigenous population of about 8,000. 
The Dayaks were the largest indigenous group in the interior, comprising Aban, Bidaya, and other interior tribes such as the Kayan, Kelebet, Kenya, Loon Bawang, and Penan, while coastal areas were dominated by the Sarawak local Malays, Melanau, Bruneian, and Kedayan. The government of Sarawak welcomed the migration of Chinese workers to boost the economy. Following various immigration schemes initiated by the Rajas, the population increased to 150,000 in 1848, 300,000 in 1893, 475,000 in 1933, and 600,000 in 1945. <laughs> Public service infrastructure It was during the reign of the second Raja that public infrastructure began to be given attention. From the 1930s, a telegraph line connected the country with Singapore. Wireless telegraph stations were located in all major towns in Sarawak. Postal service was also available throughout the administration. The river systems in Sarawak are not interconnected. As a result, coastal ships were used by the Brook government to carry merchandise from one river system to another. The Brook government also established a trade route from Kuching to Singapore, using its own ships such as the Royalist, Julia, and the Swift. Among the early cargoes were antimony and gold. The Borneo Company Limited bought another steamer, which they named the Sir James Brook, to carry antimony, coal, and sago. The ships were the link between Sarawak and Singapore. Charles Brook encouraged the Sarawak Chamber of Commerce to set up its own shipping lane to Singapore, offering to sell the Royalist to it. In 1875, the Singapore and Sarawak Steamship Company was formed and, shortly thereafter, bought the Royalist and the steamer the Raja Brook. There were complaints that the company provided irregular services to its customers and, in 1908, the Brook government transferred another two small steamships, the Atta and Kaka, to the company in expectation of improvement. In 1919, Chinese interests bought the company's shares, liquidated it and formed a new company named the Sarawak Steamship Company. The company established shipping lanes linking the Rajang, Limbang, and Baram River systems. The Cebu Singapore shipping lane was started by the company but soon abandoned, being unprofitable. The establishment of the shipping lanes by Sarawak Steamship Company allowed the indigenous people to participate in wider markets, thus narrowing the income gap between urban and rural areas in Sarawak. The company suffered heavy losses in the trade depression of the 1920s and was acquired by the Singapore-based Straits Steamship Company. The company established branches at Cebu and Bintulu and installed agents at other small river ports. Land transport in Sarawak was poorly developed owing to the swampy environment around rivers downstream, while dense jungles presented significant challenges to road construction inland. Most of the roads were constructed in coastal areas. Borneo Company Limited and Sarawak Oilfields also constructed a small number of short roads to serve their own economic interests. Meanwhile, in the interior, raised batang paths were made by the natives using logs to connect villages and their environs, easing access to farms and collection of forest produce. At the same time, rivers remained the most important means of transportation to coastal towns. In the first 70 years of Brook Rule, bridal paths were constructed to connect administrative posts to the surrounding districts. After the 1930s, the policy was changed to providing access from villages to navigable rivers. Road construction during the Brook era was, however, uncoordinated. Most of the roads located near the towns were short, with the exception of the economically important Miri Lutong Road built by Sarawak Oilfields, the Jambusan Road to Tegora via the Dayan Estate, and Penrisan Road built by the Brook government. Together with the road developments, bullock carts were introduced together with porters, and hand carts in the mid-19th century, followed by rickshaws at the end of 19th century, and bicycles in the early 20th century. Public motor services appeared in 1912 together with private taxis. In 1915, a short railway connecting Kuching to Tenth Mile was opened to the public. Subsequent construction of a road running parallel to the railway led to substantial losses, however, and its operations were limited to transportation of rocks from Seventh Mile to Kuching. In 1894, while plans for electric street lightning were being drawn up in Penang and Kuala Lumpur on the Malay Peninsula, Raja Charles Brooke refused to adopt this new technology because of his dislike of new-fangled things. The sparse population of Sarawak also presented a logistical challenge to install power stations and connecting cables. 
However, wired telephones were installed around Kuching in 1898 for keeping up-to-date communications with the outstations. Otherwise, messages from the northernmost areas of the state such as Limbang and Baram could take up to a month to reach Kuching. Besides, telephones were cheap to install and required little power. By 1908, the Muka Oya region was connected to telephone lines, followed by Miri in 1913, and Cebu in 1914. The first wireless telegraphy station was erected in Kuching in 1917, followed by Cebu and Miri immediately thereafter. It was not until 1914 that the first electrical power stations were installed in Miri by Anglo-Saxon Petroleum Company and BAO by the Borneo Company Limited. The oil production boom in Miri and gold mining in BAO gave rise to the need of more efficient lightning and motor systems. Cinematography also began the same year in Miri. In 1920, J. R. Barnes, the manager of the Sarawak Government Wireless Telegraphs and Telephones Department, proposed an electrical lightning scheme for Kuching using a coal-fired system. In January 1923, a power station covering an area of 6,700 square feet 620 square meters was completed at Ku Hun Yang Street, Kuching, and started operation in June 1923, supplying Kuching with direct current DC system. Today the road where the power station was once located is now known as the Power Street. Cebu's first power station was installed in 1927, followed by Muka in 1929. From 1922 to 1932, the electrical supply in Kuching was managed by the Electrical Department, under the jurisdiction of Public Works Department. This department was then privatized as the Sarawak Electricity Supply Company Sesco. Topic. Science In 1854, Alfred Russell Wallace arrived in Kuching as a guest of James Brooke. In 1855, he wrote a paper entitled, On the Law Which Has Regulated the Introduction of New Species, also known as the Sarawak Law, which anticipated aspects of Darwin's theory of evolution. It is said, albeit without any evidence, that Charles Brooke approved the construction of Sarawak State Museum in 1888, the oldest museum in Borneo, with endorsement from Wallace. Charles Hose, who served under Brooke as an administrator in the Baram region, was an avid photographer, naturalist, ethnologist, and author. He is credited with the discovery of various mammal and bird species endemic to Borneo. Some of his specimens are now housed in London's Natural History Museum catalog. His ethnological collections are in, amongst others, the British Museum. Topic. Media The Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society since 1820, the Sarawak Gazette since 1870, and the Sarawak Museum Journal since 1911 hold a significant amount of information on Sarawak before and during the Raj's administration. Topic. See also History of Sarawak List of heads of government of the Kingdom of Sarawak Topic. Footnotes Topic. References Topic. Further reading Keppel, Henry, Brooke, James, Walter Keating, Kelly, 1847. The Expedition to Borneo of HMS. Dido for the Suppression of Piracy, with extracts from the Journal of James Brooke, ESQ, of Sarawak. University of California Libraries. London, Chapman and Hall. p. 347. Lowe, Hugh, 1848. Sarawak, its inhabitants and productions, being notes during a residence in that country with His Excellency Mr. Brooke. Robarts Library, University of Toronto Libraries. London, Richard Bentley. p. 466. Jacob, Gertrude Legrand. 1876. The Raja of Sarawak, an account of Sir James Brooke, KCB, LL.D., given chiefly through letters and journals. University of Michigan Library. London, Macmillan & Co. p. 413. St. John, Spencer 1879. The Life of Sir James Brooke, Raja of Sarawak, from his personal papers and correspondence. University of California Libraries. W. Blackwood. 
p. 433. Treacher, W. H. 1891. British Borneo, Sketches of Brunei, Sarawak, Labuan, and North Borneo. University of California Libraries. Singapore, GOVT, Print. Department. p. 190. Roth, Henry Ling, Lowe, Hugh Brooke 1896. The Natives of Sarawak and British North Borneo, based chiefly on the MSS, of the late H. B. Lowe, Sarawak Government Service. University of Michigan Library. London, Trislov and Hansen. p. 503. Baring Gould, Sabine, Bamfylde, Charles Ager 1909. A History of Sarawak under its Two White Rajas, 1839–1908. Robarts Library, University of Toronto Libraries. London, Richard Bentley. p. 466. Runciman, Stephen The White Rajas. Cambridge University Press. University of Allahabad, Digital Library of India. p. 340. Sarawak, A Kingdom in the Jungle. The New York Times, 1986. Archived from the original on 1 August 2017. Chronology of Sarawak throughout the Brook era to Malaysia Day. The Borneo Post, 2011. Archived from the original on 1 August 2017. Sarawak, a most unusual territory. The London Gazette. Archived from the original on 4 August 2017. The Brook era, 1841 A Circumflex Euro, 1941. Sarawak State Government, 2014. Archived from the original on 7 August 2017. Yap, Joanna 2016. Tracing Influence of Brunei and Sambas in Formation of SWAC. The Borneo Post. Archived from the original on 12 August 2017. <laughs> <laughs> External links The Brook Trust. More information on heritage of the Brook dynasty.